The title for today's homily is Don't Just Do Something, Sit There. Even Jesus took naps. Usually I'm a stickler for using the liturgical calendar, which the large majority of denominations use. It's a set group of texts from the Hebrew Bible, including a psalm, a passage from the New Testament. Yet for the first time that I've been doing this homily series for Journey Road, I simply cannot do this today. I want to go to directly address the tension and anxiety shared by virtually everyone in this country as the future of our country is literally on the line, both in the state and national elections coming up in November. Every day I'm flooded with pleas for money, some begging, some pleading, some trying to guilt me into contributing. It seems to be a never-ending flood. I feel the need to address this directly. It reminds me of the life of Jesus. As his reputation grew, it seems that everywhere he went, from town to town, even to Galilee and Samaria, where heretics lived, he was met with clamoring crowds, surrounding him, pushing him, pulling on his cloak, competing voices crying out with their pleas for healing. Very hard for him to have any me time, time alone, or with his group of beloved disciples. So he did something daring, something many of us, especially clergy, are afraid to do. Took off literally to the hills. And now I'm going to read the ways that this has happened. In Mark 1, at once the Spirit said 40 days, being tempted by Satan. Another one from Mark. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Everyone was looking for Jesus, but after his time in prayer, he told his disciples that it was time for them to move on to another village. And Luke the news of him spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Again in Luke, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent until night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him. In Mark, again in chapter 6, because so many people were coming and going but he did not even have a chance to eat. He said to his disciples, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. I could go on and on, but you get the point. Even Jesus needed to rest. Sometimes he even took naps, as my favorite t-shirt proclaims. As a reminder to me of the lands on my life, some from the outside, some even from me, need to take a back seat to rest. This Every day I take a break after lunch when I walk into the bedroom with my two cuddle cats, Bart and Priscilla. As I lie on my left side, Priscilla lies down on my arms, scrunches down and places her head right under mine, and Bart finds his accustomed place with his back curled up against my legs. And the next two hours, or hours, mostly I don't fall asleep, but fall into meditation with Priscilla's breath mingling with my own, her whiskers tickling my nose, and Bart's pressure against my legs, keeping them warm. What is more and more demands pile on, it still seems easy to forget. For instance, Cheryl and I years ago started a Sunday practice to have a meal together at our dining room table, candles lit on this holiday day once a week. It lasted for a while, but finally we gave up, settling for each of us, usually preparing our own separate dinner and sitting in our own chairs with TV trays, watching TV as we ate. I admit it is hard, with so many forces pulling at us for our time, attention, and money. I began this homily by citing a familiar quotation from one of the Berrigan brothers during the protests about our involvement in the Vietnam War and the compulsory draft, they were Jesuit priests. Don't just do something, sit there. And they did. Just like the counter sit-ins in the segregated South in the 60s, the salt mine protests in India in 1960, the occupying British depended on natives to harvest the salt mines. But with Gandhi's leadership, the entire group of workers protested. 
There was no violence, no shouting, but they stood in solidarity against the inhuman working conditions. Each man, one at a time, walking up to the British, holding cudgels to submit to a beating. This continued until the British, exhausted and defeated, laid down their cudgels. Cheryl and I had a little taste of this when we were in seminary. There was a peaceful protest by the Pacific School of Religion for faculty and seminary students to take place on a busy street in San Francisco. All of us wearing our clerical garb just sat down together in a busy intersection to stop the traffic from all directions. Cheryl told me that she really enjoyed the big business having to turn around because of our peaceful presence. At the appointed time, when the police showed up, those who had already agreed to be arrested just got up and filed peacefully onto the waiting buses. Inner life is just as important as outward activity. Everyone needs that still space in the turning world, even Jesus. Here is another poem by my favorite poet, Mary Oliver, of just an ordinarily normal summer day. It's called A Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is gazing around with her enormous complicated eyes. Now she lifts up her pale forearms thoroughly, washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is your plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I believe that we are all called to live a wild and precious life. Sometimes it takes vocal protest, a peaceful sit-in, even a moment in an ordinary day to look closely at the miracle of a grasshopper. Listen again to these prophetic words. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I don't know how to pay attention. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. I did something similar last week when I went outside the front door. To the left was a spider web that the spider was still weaving. The sun was shining on the web as a little spider kept excreting the filament and pulling it across the empty space. Then when it was attached, reached out a tiny arm just to pull the new thread more tightly to make a perfectly symmetrical web. I was stunned. This little spider, so small when it was newly hatched, had inside of her all the wisdom she needed to create this miracle. It was hard to take my eyes off this happening. I look to see if there's any other miracle in the making every morning. Please indulge me by watching this spider spinning her web. Breathe in and out as you watch this miracle.
Well, I see it's time to take my nap, but first I need to put on my new t-shirt and go out and check on the spiders. All right. <laughs> 